It's Joel Bayer and I'm back here on Five giving you guys some special content. I'm here with the one and only Mr. Jamie Morelli. Now you guys might be thinking, who's Jamie? You'll find out in a second. Just to give you guys a heads up, he is the New Era Global founder, right? Uh, and they deal with loads of players, amazing players in Premier League, young players, players worldwide. And he's also responsible for some of Rio Ferdinand's professional moves. Now with the transfer window open, things happening for some clubs, things not happening too much for some clubs. We're here to discuss and find out why. What is the process? What goes on during this period from the player side of views, the agent side of views and the clubs? There's no one better to speak to but Jamie. So if you can let them know a bit about yourself and the fact that you were a former player as well. Yes, I had a, about a 17-year career. I started at Crystal Palace um, at about 12 clubs. So a bit of a journeyman in the end. <laughs> I'm glad you said it. But yeah, and then on retirement, and I say that loosely because you're only 35. So listen, many men work harder than that at retirement. But um, I decided to to set up New Era Global Sports. It was a new era for me. It was a, a different direction I wanted to take in my life. I didn't fancy going down the coaching route. I just wanted to... I love managing players and managing people. So, yep, 12 years down the line, uh, here we are. We're, we're flourishing. We've got um, a lovely stable of young and old players and doing a, a lot of stuff in terms of the lads after football and, and people like Anton Ferdinand, Daniel Gabidon, Ashley Williams, Rio Ferdinand, all in that second part transition in life, um, working within the game and then got some fantastic young talent uh, the likes of Matthew Cox and Charlie Patino and, um, you know, Matthew Garber, who just played in a World Cup qualifier for New Zealand, on top of many more, Max Ahrens, Ben Godfrey, the Murphy Twins, Mason Holgate, I mean, it, Michael Keane, the list go on. So it's a real good time for us at the minute. And this is the time now where we wake up, we come alive because he's transfer window. You got one of my boys as well, Charlie Patino, that you forgot to mention at Arsenal as well. So you're actually looking at the next, the younger generation as well, which is really good, isn't it? Yeah, you have to look at all tiers. I mean, it's a it's a revolving door. And as the, the lads have we've seen, the likes of your Rios and Antons and Daniel Gabadons and Williamses and the next tranche of your Neil Taylors that start to to go in transition and retire, you need the hotbed of the young talent, the 17, 18, 19 year olds coming through that will continue for the agency to flourish for many years to come. Female footballers as well, mm -hmm. Farrah, Farrah Williams as well. We can go on for ages yeah. where you do, but yeah. um, okay, so we're here looking at the transfer window side sure. of things. There's a couple clubs that have been active, we can say in the Premier League yeah. or some clubs more than others. Yeah. And then you have former powerhouses. And when I say former powerhouses, like regular Premier League winners like Chelsea, yeah. Man United, they've been a little bit quiet during this transfer window. Can you explain to me what is going on from what you can understand? I think you always see a trend and a lot of it is to do with just continuity within a football club. And I think Arsenal have got that now, probably best place for that. Served for the last four or five years. He's got a manager that's in place. He's got a good blend of youngsters. He knows what he wants to do. He's got his recruitment right. And they've they've come out the traps and they've signed three or four players. You see Tottenham already one or two in. Looks like they're going to make some more moves in the next couple of weeks. Uh, settled manager to a certain degree. Clubs going in the right direction. The problems with that... Chelsea have had with their their, their ownership has, has stunted their growth a little, little bit and Man United with the fact the new managers come in the fact they don't have a, a sporting director or somebody that you would say was a former like David Gill that was out there already uh, doing the deals doing the background searches so that when the the window open they would always strike one uh, very very early so they could get a settled squad go to the Far East or or the Middle East, wherever they're going to go pre-season and, and have a settled squad. Because of the, the fracturedness within the club from top to bottom, uh, it looks like a few of their targets have already gone to opposing clubs and this could be a problem for them. I mean, they need to do business, they need to do business quick, but they need to get the right players at the right price. And I think that that generally takes three or four months of good recruitment. And I don't know whether at this moment in time, they have those experienced per people within the football club and it's put them on the back foot. Wow, so that's interesting. Now, we're not saying that Man United haven't signed anyone <laughs> or they're not going to sign anyone. We're just talking about the difference between what it was like before and what it is now. Sure. So someone such as yourself, yeah. what would your position be if, it, it, when it comes to these kind of transfers? Are you like a, a, a sole agent or how does it all work? 
I think generally what happens from the agent's point of view is that you get the you know the uh, the, the the club, uh, the the head of recruitment, the sporting director, and, and the owner will get together. They will look at a list of of, of uh, requirements that they need, their recruitment list, and if for argument's sake, uh, one of those players is 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 a client of mine. First port of call is that I will get a call from the club to say to me, uh, we're interested in your player. Say it's Mason Holgate. We're interested in Mason. What's his situation? How long has he got at Everton? Uh, where, do you, where do they value him? What price do they value him? Uh, we've done all the due diligence. We like him as a player. It's going to come down to price points. Uh, we've only got a budget of £15 million. Can you get the deal done? So then my port of call then would be speaking to the people at Everton, whether that be Mr. Bill Kemwright or or if it's Steve Parrish uh, at Crystal Palace and say, listen, I have a club that's interested in my client. Where do you see the deal? And he says 20 million. I say, OK, well, I think I've got 15 here. You want 20. Can we compromise? Can we get a deal done, get the clubs talking and get a deal done at 17, 18 million? Once that's in place and you've got the deal in place club to club, they then turn around and say, what kind of money is Mason looking for? What is his personal um, package going to look like? Because we need to know that, you know, it's going to work within the structure of this football club. So then you talk about the finances. So then you get that in place. So then all of a sudden, then the bid goes in, the bid gets accepted. I then ring up Mason. I said, we have to go and take a medical. So then I take him to go and get a medical. His medical history, you go through that process. And eventually, once you get the all clear, at that point, you can put pen to paper. And that may and could potentially take anything from one week to, to, to six weeks to, to, to just go to dot the I's and the T's. So, you know, it's not something that just when a transfer breaks, it doesn't automatically think that that deal's done. There's many hurdles that it has to achieve before we could actually put pen to paper. And the day that you're walking out with your boy, that's when you know the deal's done. <laughs> so anything you, you could have a Steven Gerrard, Liverpool to Chelsea, last minute U-turn. Yeah. Any have you had any of them? Yeah, I've had a few like that before where you've been, you've had a bit accepted and you got permission to speak. And then a, f a club B hear about the noise. And then they then speak to the club and they also accept at that same terms. So now you have to speak to both clubs. You said Club B. You're not trying to name any, <clears throat> any names. What's going on here? No, Party it could be Club, club B. I'm an example. Yeah. <laughs> I could be taking a boy to Crystal Palace and then Everton come on or West Ham come on. And then, then you have two clubs for your one player. Mm -hmm. It's not always about who can pay the most money or who, who can pay the most wages. In certain cases, it is. But it could come down to style of football and making sure that your player is going to be conducive to the style of play. Do you so, care about that? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. I think you can look short term and you can go and put your per, uh, player into a team and may get an extra 10 grand a week, 5 grand a week, 100 pounds a week. But if you put him into a place where he fits the bill... Uh, his his attributes are going to be shown then over a longer period of time you're going to get the best out of that player and he's got more chance of then getting a further deal out of that club so the longevity is going to be better to, to for me to, to to take the the road where you're going to go and play 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 that to your strengths I need an example is there a player that you've been it doesn't matter which <clears throat> tier of football that you thought okay cool a move here might be possible but actually it's better for him to go here for the long term. Yeah, I think it could be one where something as simple as maybe like you say, someone like an Ashley Williams, you know, who who, who was a late developer, he was playing at Stockport and then, you know, he got his move to, to Swansea because that was under the involvement of your Roberto Martinez and then your Brendan Rodgers. And that was a, one of the first teams really, especially at the championship that really started to play that continental play through the lines. And he was a ball playing centre back. And, and although he could be, be rough and ready and he, he, you know, he could win his duels, he, when he, when he had the ability to get the ball down and play, he could play through the lines and, and, and Swansea was a complete perfect setup for that. And then obviously, he then got into into the Wales team, took the team onto the Euro semis, and then got a big move at the latter stages of of thirty to Everton um, because, like I say, he was in the right in the right team that was the, his fit. So I think that's the most important for me. Most more than money is that you place your players. 
where their ability can shine. And then once they believe in that, then they've got more chance of getting further moves down the line and the money will come. You seem like a calm man <clears throat> every time I speak with you, always in control. Uh, but sometimes you can't control uh, players. No. You know, they've got different personalities, sure. as you know. Some people, you know, they're ahead of other people yeah. physically in, in regards yeah. to playing football, but mentally as well, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with different personalities when it comes to issues? Does it depend on what issue it is? Does it depend on, you know, their age? Does it depend on what they believe in? How do you deal with players where you might have a bit of difficulty? Yeah, I think it's like if you look at the best managers in the world, whether that you see Pep Guardiola now or or from Alex Ferguson in, in, in the past, or you or you can align it to being a school teacher. It could be 30 kids in there, 30 players in there. Every kid has got a different personality. Every kid is coming from a different background. Some children are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Some have got one parent family. Some go home and and life isn't nice at home. Um, so you have to get to know each individual, find out their needs in order to get the best out of them. The only way you're going to invest your time to, to to find out what makes them tick, give them that little bit of TLC. I love a rough diamond, someone that's maybe, you know, been rejected uh, at clubs. And I, and I can see that ability. You know, it might be from the estates or, and you think, you know what, if I could get hold of him, just, just try and... Just, just just try and get him a little bit more professional, put a bit of work into him, let him understand that he's, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You've got to eat right, you've got to train right, and you only get out of this game what you put in and then you see the rewards coming out on the pitch and then they go on then and they go and play for their country or they go and play in the Premier League. They're beautiful moments. So I think that the only way you're going to get to be that man management and identify the different flaws and each character's different is by investing your time. And I think once you do that, then one size don't fit all. Uh, some will react to a telling off, some will shy away and you need to know your players. And I think then once you 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 you, you provide that service, then your players can thrive. That's awesome stuff, man. That's really put things into perspective. Now, Rio Ferdinand, mm. one of your <clears throat> main clients at yeah. Neuro Global, yeah. um, you guys, I like to see the way you guys get along. And to mm -hmm. be honest with you, I look at you guys from afar and I try to learn as much as possible. Yeah. You engineered, I say engineered because it wasn't really engineered, mm. but you helped facilitate the move when he got released from Man United yeah. to QPR. Now, that's a that's a big profile player coming to the end of his career. Um, how does that actually happen? Um, <clears throat> like you say, I think you don't need, you could be an estate agent or a travel agent mm. to move Rio. He yeah. was such a good player. I think if we go back a step, the two years prior to leaving, we'd done that contract and that was quite a big contract. He was coming to the end. It was coming to the end of Sir Alex Ferguson's yeah. reign. Yeah. But Rio was becoming a real kind of face on this kind of social media scene, the early days. And when we got a bit of downtime in the summers and stuff, we would go to Indonesia, we'd go to Malaysia, we'd go to certain parts, we'd go to, to, to China, Beijing, um, and we would go and meet the fans and these guys that have only ever seen Man United and Rio on the TV, never been able to uh, have the money to be able to come. And I mean, there's two, 300 million people that support Man United around the world. There's only 52,000 that can, can get into Old it's Trafford. Crazy. So we used to go on these tours and stuff and he built a, he realised that he had a big fan base outside of Manchester. So we started to play with social media a little bit and then Man United realised that through uh, Rio, they could connect with the likes of LeBron James or Snoop Dogg come to town or whether it's P. Diddy. And they went so exactly. And that was something that that alignment through soccer in the UK has seen from America had never been seen before. So in his tra I knew his transition would always be as big as what he's got because from the early stages, KSI when he was breaking through, mm -hmm. Harry Styles I brought into Rio's restaurant when we was One Direction blew wow. up. So straight away United said, well, okay, I mean, we've not just got a commercial vehicle here. We've got a fantastic player, but we've got someone that can take us into the social media early beginnings, infancy. Sorry to interrupt, but this, <clears throat> this then puts into line where you see Rio 
with the camera at the Man United pre-season tours. He's yeah. always had it in him. Yeah. I've actually seen some of the footage and it's yeah. incredible. We're just waiting for clearance to hopefully release it on the channel. But go on, Jim. Yeah, so that then so then when he come to so he was gonna leave at that point. Fergie was leaving. I just won the Premier League with um uh, he scored he scored against Swansea in the last game of the season, one of Fergie's last Premier League. And it was like, what are we gonna do? But we sit down with United. We got different hats on here. We got Rio as a player. Rio is an older kind of like player that could help the next generation. But we've also got someone here that can fit the bill commercially. This guy's too good to let go out the door right now, you know. So we started to speak with United about how can we raise their awareness globally, you know, and that was through going on pre-season tours, Rio taking the handheld camera, doing some behind the scenes stuff, seeing the likes of the young emerging talent like your Rashfords and your Lingards coming through. So, so so, that was important for them at that point that he was that person that could, could and then obviously handed the baton over and the rest of the lads and then got to a situation where he's coming to the real latter end of his career. Um, his kids and he bought a plot of land in, back in London. His mum and dad were, were in London and he always knew that at one point he was going to come back to London. So he said to me, go and find me a club in London. So that season, Queen's Park Rangers had just been promoted. I thought it was a no-brainer really. I, I spoke to Mr Redknapp, Harry, who Harry. was like a you know, godfather to father figure, grandfather figure to Rio. He gave him his opportunity at West Ham as a young kid. I said, hey, you're, you're back here now in the hot seat at Queen's Park Rangers. Rio's available on a free. He can give you some experience for your younger ones. He's played in the Premier League. He can help you out. Uh, what's your feelings about, you know, potentially having him for a it year and see how we go? And he said to me, Jamie, I'd love to have him. He said, I love Rio. I think he's got, still got something to offer on and off the pitch. He said, if you go and have a conversation with my owner at the time, Mr. Fernandez, I met him at Heathrow. We sat down. It took all of half an hour and Rio signed for Queen's Park Rangers. So um, that deal was done pretty lively. It wasn't a real, really about finances. It was just about standard of living, getting his family settled back in, in, in London. Um, him being back with his family and then playing, play, playing football for the last year. Jamie. We're going to be sitting down a few more times. No um, I'm leaving it here just so there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a cliffhanger. Mm. Um, there's more that we can talk about when it comes to for transfers sure. during the whole transfer window. Mm. And uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you very much for agreeing to do uh, this, shall I say, series, these plot of videos with us where we can learn more about the behind the scenes. Yeah. And for you guys watching, please make sure you like, share, comment and subscribe. We're trying to bring you guys great alternative content. During the course of the season, you're going to get the player interviews. You're going to get the five formations. You're going to get a match day 360s. But there's also people who have the brains behind the scenes. And we want to educate you guys watching. So, Jamie, thank you very much. And uh, I'll see you very soon. And all I'd say is you tell us what you want. Yes. You'll, you'll watch Guy Sports. You'll watch the transfer window. Yeah. You're all inquisitive as to what happens and how do the agency life uh, work behind the scenes. If you've got any questions or you want to know, uh, certain scenarios, then then let us know and we'll we'll answer your questions. My guy, thank you very much, man. Nice one. Cheers. Thank you.